Hello there, just before we get into today's video, why not check out a new channel from me called War of Graphics? Want to know all the details about some of history's most famous battles and wars? Come join me on War of Graphics. From Sherman's March to the Sea to Operation Barbarossa, if it's got people fighting each other, we'll cover it. There is a link below. I hope to see you over there. And now, today's video. The years 2010 to 2014 saw the release of three Expendables films, throwback action rom starring a roster of aging 1980s action stars including Sylvester Stallone, Dolph Lundgren, Bruce Willis, Chuck Norris, Jean-Claude Van Damme, and Arnold Schwarzenegger as retired mercenaries back for one final job and presumably easy nostalgia-fueled paychecks. While the notion of assembling a team of 60-year-olds to carry out a dangerous mission might seem like pure Hollywood nonsense, it's not as outlandish as it might appear. Face with a potential diplomatic crisis. During the Second World War, British intelligence called upon a team of real-life expendables to carry out a daring commando raid in neutral Portuguese India. This is the incredible story of Operation Creek, the last ride of the Calcutta Light Horse. The Battle of the Atlantic, which raged from the very first day of World War II to the very last, has been covered extensively on this very channel. But the desperate struggle between Allied shipping and German U-boats was not confined to the frigid waters of the North Atlantic. U-boat operations ranged as far afield as the Indian Ocean, where the marauding submarines wreaked havoc on ships sailing in and out of British India. And this deadliness only increased thanks to an unexpected helping hand. In August 1939, the freighters Arenfels, Braunfels, and Drachenfels of the German DDG Hansa shipping line received a radio message warning them that Germany would soon be at war with Britain. The ships immediately made their way to the nearest neutral harbour, Moor Mugau, in Goa, India. While most of the sub continent had been colonized by Britain, Goa, located on India's west coast, some 500 kilometers south of Bombay, had been a colony of Portugal since 1510. And while Portugal had long been an ally of Britain, during the Second World War it chose to remain neutral, its cities and overseas territories becoming hotbeds of Allied and Axis spies. The three German freighters were soon joined by another Axis vessel, the Italian freighter Anfora. But since all four were merchant ships, they were not considered a threat and were ignored by both Portugal Portuguese and British colonial authorities. Then, in the fall of 1942, Allied shipping losses in the Indian Ocean began to skyrocket, with 46 merchantmen being sunk over a six-week period. If losses continued at this rate, the flow of supplies to Allied troops fighting in the Far East would soon be choked off. At the same time, agents of Special Operations Executive, or SOE, Britain's wartime sabotage and subversion organization, intercepted coded radio messages, relaying the positions of Allied merchant ships leaving Bombay. The signals were coming from the Ehrenfels, moored in Mamago Harbour. This discovery placed SOE in a delicate position. As taking out the Ehrenfels and its transmitter in a neutral harbour would be a diplomatic disaster, SOE agents Lt. Col. Lewis Pugh and Col. Gavin Stewart decided instead to target the network of German and Indian nationalist spies who gathered the shipping information for transmission to the U-boats. At the head of this network was the Gestapo agent Robert Koch, codenamed Trumpet, who lived with his wife Crete in Goa's capital of Panaji. On December 19, 1942, Pugh and Stewart staged a daring kidnapping in broad daylight, abducting Koch and his wife at gunpoint and bundling them into a waiting car. They then sped out of the city, cut the telephone lines to the border, and injected their captives with a powerful sedative before driving on to the border crossing. As one officer spoke to the border guards, the other waited in the car with the unconscious Kochs. In case of trouble, the plan was to toss a sack of rupees into the street to distract the locals, then ram the car through the gate and escape into British India. Mercifully, the guard suspected nothing, and the two agents were allowed to cross the border unmolested. The cocks were then taken to Castle Rock, Karnataka, for interrogation. The ultimate fate of the couple is unclear, with accounts differing as to whether they were released or shot as spies, but whatever the case, their abduction did little to stem the tide of U-boat attacks. In the first half of March 1943 alone, 12 Allied vessels totaling 80,000 tons were sent to the bottom of the Indian Ocean. And with that, SOE was left with only one option, sink the Ehrenfels. Given the delicate diplomatic situation, an open attack by regular British forces was out of the question. However, a covert operation by a group of trained civilians might just do the trick. To carry out this daring raid, Pugh and Lewis turned to an unlikely outfit known as the Calcutta Light Horse. Originally formed in 1872, the Calcutta Light Horse was a reserve cavalry regiment which had served with distinction during the Boer War and the First World War. By 1943, however, the unit was more a social club than a military unit, composed mainly of 
middle-aged, out-of-shape bankers, merchants, and solicitors too old or unfit for regular military service. But they were all eager to see action, and their involvement would lend the raid, codenamed Operation Creek, enough plausible deniability to avoid a diplomatic disaster. In early March of 1942, Pugh approached the commander of the Calcutta Light Horse, Colonel William Grice, and revealed to him the details of the operation. Though the raid would be highly risky, he explained, since it was top secret, the men would receive no credit, no pay, no medals, and no pensions if anything went wrong. Though initially skeptical, Grice assembled his men and asked for 18 volunteers, informing them only that, I can tell you nothing about it except that the operation should take about a fortnight and will involve a short sea voyage. There it is, gentlemen. I leave it to you. Is anyone willing to volunteer? The 30 men assembled raised their hands. Grice then set about winnowing down the volunteers, eliminating anyone too old or ill to serve. Among those accepted for the raid was Corporal William Manners, who had lost an eye in a childhood accident and wore a glass replica in its place. When questioned about his selection, Grice simply replied, It was good enough for Admiral Horatio Nelson. Why shouldn't it be all right for you? In the end, 14 men from the Calcutta Light Horse were selected for the mission, the raiding party being filled out with four men from the rival Calcutta Scottish Regiment. This ragtag bunch of over-the-hill reservists was then put through a crash course in commando operations, being instructed in hand-to-hand combat weapons and explosives handling, and shipboarding procedures. They then studied the blueprints of the Arendvels captured by SOE. The regular army drill sergeants in charge of the training were less than impressed by their over-the-hill trainees, with one complaining, if these are the Light Horse, what what must the heavy mob be like? Nonetheless, the men dutifully completed their training and, to avoid suspicion, made their way in small groups by train to the southwestern port of Kochi, from where they would board a ship that would take them to Goa. When they arrived, however, the men of Operation Creek discovered to their shock that the ship was not a Royal Navy destroyer or even a torpedo boat, but a tiny 30-year-old steam hopper barge called the Phoebe. Used to dredge rivers and canals, the Phoebe was barely seaworthy and had to hug the Indian coast to keep from capsizing. But with British shipping in the Far East stretched to its breaking point, it was all that could be spared. Meanwhile, SOE officer Richard Lippitt traveled to Goa to arrange a distraction. The attack was scheduled for the early morning of March the 9th, when the Catholic colony would be celebrating the last day of carnival. To ensure that most of the RFL's crew would be ashore and distracted, Lippitt, posing as an employee of Liverpool-based shipping line John Holt & Company, persuaded the wife of a prominent German resident to hold a reception for the officers of the German and Italian ships. He also paid local brothel owners to offer a free night of services to all sailors in the harbor. Finally, he bribes local officials to ensure that both the lighthouse and boy marking the entrance to the harbor would be inoperative on the night of the attack. And with that, the stage was set for one of the unlikeliest covert operations of the Second World War. Around 2.30 a.m. on March the 9th, 1943, the Phoebe slipped into the Mormario Harbor and steamed straight for the Ehrenfels. With the lighthouse out of commission and the harbor basin bathed in darkness, the skeleton crew aboard the German freighter had little time to react before grappling hooks and bamboo boarding ladders came clattering out of the gunwales. The crew switched on the ship's searchlight, but a round from a submarine gun immediately destroyed it moments before the paunchy, middle-aged commandos of the Calcutta Light Horse came storming aboard. Faces blackened with camouflage paint, shoes soles in an inch of sound deadening felt, and pockets stuffed with explosives, the raiders fanned out across the ship, quickly dispatching the captain and five crew members. One man even took a moment to drill a pistol round through a portrait of Adolf Hitler hanging in the captain's wardroom. But while the raiders had achieved total surprise, they were too slow to prevent the German crew from incinerating the ship's codebook, setting off a fire trap on her stern, and disabling her engines. They also managed to blast the ship's horn, the prearranged signal to shore in case of enemy attack. However, with Carnival still in full swing, the Portuguese authorities were slow to react. Meanwhile, the team of raiders ventured below decks and located the Ehrenfels secret transmitter, which they reduced to scrap metal with explosives and machine gun fire. But with the ship's deck ablaze and her engines out of commission, the raider's initial plan to commandeer or tow away the Ehrenfels had to be abandoned. She would have to be scuttled in place instead. Thankfully, the crew had beaten them to the punch, opening the ship's sea cocks to keep her out of enemy hands. Commander Bernard Davis, the captain of the Phoebe, ordered the barge's lines cast off and the boarding party to withdraw. As they did, the Ehrenfels crew regrouped and counterattacked, only to be driven off by gunfire and blast from a fire extinguisher. A few were tackled to the deck, handcuffed and dragged aboard the Phoebe as prisoners before the barge pulled away and steamed into the darkness. Within minutes, the Ehrenfels burst into flames and sank to the bottom of the harbor. This was followed by explosions aboard the Braufels, Drachenfels, and Anfora, whose crew, fearing Goa was being invaded by the British, decided to preemptively scuttle their ships. As she slipped out of Goa, Phoebe transmitted a single code word to SOE headquarters, Longshanks. Mission accomplished. 
Operation Creek was an unqualified success, with all four Axis ships being sent to the bottom for a loss of not a single raider. Axis crew members who abandoned ship were arrested by the Portuguese authorities and in turn for the remainder of the war. Local newspapers reporting that conflicts between pro-Nazi and anti-Nazis had caused the crews to mutiny and scuttle their own ships. Thus, the secrecy of the operation was maintained and diplomatic relations between Britain and Portugal preserved. More importantly, however, the raid had an immediate and dramatic effect on Allied shipping losses. In the second half of March, German U-boats sank only a single ship, the Panamanian freighter Norton. In April, they sank only three. The Allied war effort in the Far East was now free to kick into high gear. Meanwhile, the volunteers of the Calcutta Light Horse, sworn to secrecy over their role in the raid, quietly returned to their civilian lives. Among these was Jack Breen, a partner in a life insurance firm. Upon returning to work, Breen was confronted by his partner and handed a newspaper article about the sinking of Axis ships. Acting innocent, Breen asked what that had to do with anything, to which his partner replied, Hell of a lot. Didn't you know I'd insured the damn things? They're worth over £4.5 million. pounds. would be a claim, as long as you're armed. Unable to speak openly about their contributions to the war effort, the men of Calcutta Light Horse instead created a secret symbol of their daring raid, a seahorse which they included on the masthead of Gallup, the regimental magazine, and crafted into jewelry for their wives. For many years, no one outside of this exclusive group knew what the symbol meant. In 1947, following India's independence from Britain, the regiment was finally disbanded. But the motley crew of middle-aged businessmen had proven their worth to the very end, epitomizing American General Douglas MacArthur's famous maxim that that an old soldier never dies, he just fades away. And if this unlikely story sounds like the plot of a movie, that's because it was! In 1974, the British government finally declassified all documents pertaining to Operation Creek. These formed the basis for author James Lesaw's 1978 non-fiction book, Boarding Party, which two years later was adapted into the feature film The Sea Wolves, starring Gregory Peck, David Niven, and Roger Moore. 